quickly. And we can't just say, okay, uh, human resources is going to ask, answer a question about the common attorney's office, and we'll take six weeks to maybe give you an answer, that, which isn't really the answer. Where Cass County can do it in three days. So the county attorney has to be at the forefront of saying, this is what transparency means. These are the records, not of the county, not of the department. They're generated, they are public records, they belong to everyone in this county, and we need to do everything we can that when they make a request, it's answered, and it's answered in a timely manner. Any safe question? Government transparency seems to be a recurring issue throughout government. What can be done to make the county attorney's office more transparent? I think the county attorney's office is pretty transparent. I talked about data requests, and uh, Mr. Dimmich made some comments here but, uh, that are not entirely accurate. All government data is presumed public. That is the law. There are exceptions to that that are codified in Minnesota Statutes Chapter 13. That's what we follow in determining which information can and should be released upon receiving a request. Those requests are made to specific responsible authorities that, again, are set out by Minnesota law. The data that the county attorney's office has is going to be, could be, different than data that the sheriff's office has. We don't have every single one of the policies of the sheriff's office and the county attorney's office, and we shouldn't maintain more data than we are required to under the law. So the requests need to be made to the, res the appropriate responsible authority. Uh, again, I said earlier that almost every data request that our office receives is processed and the data is provided to the public within one business day. Now, I've heard um, from various people in the community that there could be more information on the website, that we could provide more statistics or information. We could do that. I would love to do that. But I don't know where the staff time would come. I'm not going to ask the county board to hire an additional staff person, salary, benefits, and the like, to come into my office to do analyst work. Instead, we respond to those inquiries on a case-by-case -case basis by providing information. I also do an annual report to the board. If you go to ICTV's website, you can search for the Itasca County Board of Commissioners meetings. I spent over 30 minutes discussing the cases, the statistics, various information for our office for 2021. That meeting date was November 16th of 2021. Um, you can review all of that information there. Additionally, I work to go out to the community and provide information, speaking engagements, both at local schools and community groups. I've yet to receive an invitation to one of these groups that we've declined. I think it's very important to go out into the community and share the work that we do and educate about what the role of a county attorney is and isn't, because we can only do the work that we are authorized to do under the Minnesota laws. Thank you. Thank you. And again, Maddie, you can sure. first shot at this one. All right. <laughs> you get lots of exercise. Yes. Uh, under current law, a county attorney can ask the state attorney general to handle a case or ask for help, such as when an officer is involved in a shooting. The governor may also order the state attorney general to take over a case. Some county attorneys have expressed deep reservations over relinquishing their powers to prosecute. What would be your stand on a similar issue? Well, it's an interesting conversation and one that I really see a difference between uh, greater Minnesota, whether it's northern Minnesota or our southwestern areas and the rural, or in, in, excuse me, the, the urban counties, the Hennepin County, Ramsey County, whatever. Um, my fellow county attorneys that are in outstate Minnesota on large part agree with me. We were elected to do this job. It is my obligation to you, the voters, to handle each and every case that comes through our door whether there's ultimately a referral to a conflict attorney or the attorney general's office would fall underneath our discretion. I believe that we can carry out the duties of the office um, in the Itasca County's County Attorney's Office for the most part. Uh, most of my counterparts are not referring these cases to the attorney general. That said, there are specific cases where the attorney general's office does regularly help smaller counties. For example, Cook County, um, ended up with, I think, three appeals to the Minnesota Court of Appeals earlier this year. They had a homicide, which they almost never encounter, and a number of other serious felony cases walk in the door basically at the same time. And they have no, no choice but to respond to that, and the Attorney General's Office assisted there. We have cases at the County Attorney's Office here in Itasca County 
Um, where we go to jury trial on a case, there is an appeal which is an extensive amount of work, going through all of the court records, writing briefs, bringing them to the Court of Appeals, and sometimes the Minnesota Supreme Court. The Attorney's General, Attorney General's Office has an appeals division where they will re review those cases in which the underlying county attorney does go to jury trial, and they will handle the brief writing process. So we utilize that service from time to time. But in terms of turning over my prosecutorial duties to the Attorney General's office, um, I, I'm not prepared to just say that I would do that. Might there be a specific case? Yes. Do I want the governor to order me to, tr to turn over a case? No. I want to carry out the job that I was voted to do uh, for the rest of this term and into my next term as well. Thank you. John, same question. Under current law, a county attorney can ask the state attorney general to handle a case or ask for help such as when an officer is involved in the shooting. The governor may also order the state attorney general to take over a case. Some county attorneys express deep reservation over relinquishing their powers to prosecute. What is your stand on this issue? My opinion is, is that we need to reach out to those other sources. The Minnesota attorney general is a major player in the criminal justice system as the staffing and the expertise we need to use that. We don't need to be blinded by our own beliefs that we can handle things. And when there are officer shootings, that's not something we would be handling or should we even attempt to handle. One of the criticisms I have is that we have a conflict case. It's got to go to Cass County or Caltrami County. We work with 87, 86 other county attorneys. We build relationships. We could go to, to a county farther away, ask them to review it, and know that our citizens will be more satisfied that it was, in fact, an impartial review than what we're doing now. You know, I work, I can call up the Minneapolis City Attorney when I have city attorney questions, and they'll help me. Uh, you know, so I know it's available. I think we just need to use outside resources uh, when it's appropriate, because the bottom line is we want prosecutions, we want things to be done so justice is done. I think the best way to do that is to look to other agencies that are willing to help us who might have the extra staffing and the expertise that's necessary. Yes, thank you. I just want to clarify a couple things. The Attorney General's office is not a major player in the criminal justice system. For decades, they've had minute staff assigned to criminal prosecution. Um, until just recently, they had one criminal prosecutor and you heard in the news the Attorney General going to the legislature and asking for additional funds for criminal prosecutors to help county attorneys around the state of Minnesota. Only within the last two years has that criminal prosecution staffing been increased to a walking staff of three to assist the entire state of Minnesota. So this is not a major player in the criminal justice system. And when we're talking about conflict cases, all elected county attorneys take an oath Every attorney in Minnesota takes an oath, but we swear to uphold the Constitution, to carry out the laws of the state of Minnesota, and I trust that my counterparts in northern Minnesota, central Minnesota, do that in every case that they review. So when I'm sending out a conflict case, of course I rotate those cases in a geographic area where it's convenient for that attorney and those taxpayers of that assisting county to make the trip to travel to court. Tomorrow morning, I have an attorney who's starting a jury trial in a neighboring county. I've tried a jury trial in a neighboring county for a county who had a conflict. I'm not going to ask someone from Hennepin County, nor would I want someone from Hennepin County to come up here to Itasca County to represent the interests of the people who live here. I trust that my counterparts who are close to us can do the same. John, you wish to um, they don't have this question is, John, um, do you feel the county attorney should use their position for political promotion or posturing, or does it need to be truly nonpartisan? By definition, it is nonpartisan. I believe strongly that it is nonpartisan, and that means that we do not get involved in the political side of, of issues, nor do I believe, and it bothers me to, that in the last two elections, a lot of their staff became part of the elective process of county attorney. That should never be. They represent the county. They, they have a duty to justice. They have duty to represent unbiased. I don't see how getting involved in, in politics can do anything but lower the uh, view of, of our people in our county as to the uh, 
how many attorneys accept this? Maybe same question. Absolutely nonpartisan, and I'm sure that I've lost some votes on this question when people really push me and say, either one, you're lying and you just don't want to tell me the truth, um, or, or two, you must be the opposite of what I believe in. And I tell constituents regularly, I want you to have confidence that my office will treat your case exactly the same, whether you're a defendant, a victim, someone who's been harmed with crime, someone whose children have been removed from their home, that we are treating you the same, whether you're a member of Itasca County GOP or Itasca County DFL. I don't care what groups you subscribe to, who you voted for, you should have the confidence that each and every single case that comes into our office will be treated the same based upon the facts in the case and the applicable law. Um, with respect to uh, staff members uh, supporting me, I think that's great. I think that they want me to be their boss. Um, and that's why they show up and do that outside of work, after hours. There's absolutely no pressure placed upon my staff to participate in my campaign, to come to events, to come here to this forum tonight as private citizens, to hear who the candidates are, what they stand for, by golly, every employee in the county should have the ability and the right to go become informed about candidates, exercise their right, and support any candidate they want, whether it's my office or a different elected office. That's what I would tell a department head who was asking me that question. I'm not about to tread on any county employee's rights about who they can or can't support or what events they can go to on their own time. Okay, thank you. Maddie, you get this one? Is it time for cameras in the courtroom? If so, why, and if not, why? Another really hot topic um, in the state of Minnesota. So, did, uh, show of hands, did people watch the George Floyd trial? No? I, that was very interesting. That was an experiment in the state of Minnesota. Um, judge Cahill, in that case, actually gave me my first job out of, out of law school. He was the chief judge of Hennepin County, the uh, largest judicial district in Minnesota. He hired me, I worked with him regularly, I think he's a smart man, I think he was an excellent prosecutor, and I think he ran that trial um, in a very controlled method, uh, which was great to see. And so it was a good example of how cases can go in Minnesota. That said, I'm really sensitive to some issues. Victims, uh, victims of sex <coughs> cases, children in cases, um, families of victims, families of people who are deceased in cases. This, we are encountering these people at some of the lowest moments of their, of their life. And currently, the rules in Minnesota say that um, there are certain procedural stages a case has to get. So it can't be before a sentencing hearing. And then you have to get the written permission of any witnesses and victims who may be testifying during those hearings that they consent to, to the broadcast. So after the George Floyd trial, the uh, state of Minnesota judicial branch discussed this a little bit more. We've got prosecutors and victim groups all, all across the spectrum on this issue. I, I really tend to agree that there should be privacy and protection in place for victims of crimes and their families in certain instances. Otherwise, I, I have concerns that people may not be willing to make initial reports to law enforcement knowing that I might end up on TV. It's hard enough to get a crime victim sometimes to show up to make that report to police, to give embarrassing facts about their life, to expose private details about their life, and then go all the way to a contested court hearing or a trial where they have to sit on a stand in front of the person who have perpetrated against them or committed the crime or killed their family member, and a jury of 12 people who are all strangers, that is a big ask to get a victim to sign on for. Um, and I don't want to put them in the difficult position of saying, and now there will be court cameras on it. So I think our current rules allow for uh, the judge to have a little bit of discretion and for there to be written input from the victims and the witnesses who will be present at that hearing. And I think that's a good, a good balanced middle ground to be at for right now. Okay, John, same question. Is it time for cameras to be in the courtroom? If so, why? And if not, why? I, I am of the opinion that we need to look at how often we can put the cameras in the courtroom and have public hearings. I understand the issues, and we have to address those issues with victims. We have to address those issues that are of sensitivity of people involved. But at the same time, I think it makes our judicial system better when, the, when more people get a chance to see how it works. Because only then can they understand and accept that decision, ultimately that verdict, is something that was based on 
evidence was based on uh, a fair and impartial jury and a judge. You got to remember the judge is going to be controlling that. So I'm confident that we can do um, public hearings with the uh, oversight of the judge to know when it is when you need to be careful about what is the victim of what a particular is. But I think the only way you, you get the judicial system to be as transparent is to do it in an open manner. So I will support any efforts to make the court more open. Okay. And John, you get this question first. <laughs> get me anxious. Yeah, I know. It's, it's too loud. No, sorry. Sure. Uh, what is or would be your office policies regarding plea bargaining in drug offense cases and why? Um, we do, bargaining unfortunately has become part of the criminal justice system. Doesn't mean that as prosecutors we believe in it and are supportive, but what we need to do is we need to set forth what is the ultimate um, decision as far as if somebody takes a plea, what is the consequences going to be, if it's going to be supervised probation, how long is it going to be, what are the conditions that should be in that supervision. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that there's enough of a consequence, but at the same time, you want to reach out because there are times when maybe uh, an alternative to prison is there. I don't use it much more now, uh, Teen Challenge, for that reason. To give people another opportunity to put their lives in order, get them the treatment. Get them to mental health. Because you've got to remember that a lot of what we see isn't just the crime. It's the underlying life that they live in. And we see a lot of people who need, badly need mental health as much as they need uh, being put into the, uh, the prison system. So I believe the plea bargain should, should encompass all of that with the goal that we want to have a safe country, but we also don't want to just forget that these are people and we need to address what they have going on in their life and how do we make it solvable because that will make all of us better. Thank you. Maddie, same question. What is or would be your office policies regarding the plea bargaining and drug defense cases and why? Sure. So um, drug cases. Well, I'll start here. Plea bargaining is a necessary part of the criminal justice system, and that is because case volume is so high and judicial staff availability and resources of both the prosecutor's office and defense attorneys uh, could not handle every single case going to a jury trial. It just is not sustainable, and that's why not just in the state of Minnesota, but across the country, approximately 97% of cases resolve in a plea agreement. And that's a meeting ground um, where there are certain conditions put in place where there's a guilty plea to some sort of a charge and in many instances a predetermined sentence. And so how I handle drug offenses and plea bargaining in Itasca County is kind of two ends of the spectrum. On the low end of the spectrum, we have chemically dependent people who are addicted to drugs and they're either engaging in criminal activity just by virtue of having and using those drugs, so possessing them, or sometimes they're involved in ancillary crimes, so thefts, uh, burglaries. We see that every winter, we get these cabin burglaries. Much of that is fueled by chemical dependency. And these people sometimes might have low criminal history scores and what they really need is some oversight services by probation, uh, chemical dependency treatment, that's fine. That's on the low end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum is we have criminals. Sometimes these are not people who are even using drugs themselves. They are making money, they are bringing it into our community, they're creating all of these problems, the low level offenders, the child protection cases, kids getting removed from their homes, that is criminal conduct for which there should be a consequence. We prosecute those kind of crimes aggressively and you are either going to prison for whatever the uh, Minnesota sentencing guidelines says is the appropriate sentence, or in some instances, if they're uh, working with law enforcement, providing information, or providing by way of their defense attorney information to the prosecutor that they could be, um, 
that there are extraordinary circumstances, we sometimes will consider a program called Minnesota Teen Challenge. It is a 13-month residential program. A person must live there. It's a Christian-based program. It includes mental illness and chemical dependency treatment. And even when they go on that program, the prison sentence is hanging over their head. So not only do they complete the 13-month residential program, they also must go on probation for a period of time, typically five years, and continue to be successful. If not, we would seek revocation of their probation and execute those sentences by going to prison. So those are the two prongs that we take at the county attorney's office. Okay, we'll be able to do, I think, one more question off of this list, and then we'll move to uh, questions from the audience. Again, questions from the audience need to be written down if they Topic has been covered. Hopefully it's been satisfactory. If it hasn't been covered satisfactory, please raise your question and after this one, they'll come and they'll collect them and then we'll start on, on your questions. Uh, this one is back to Maddie. Uh, what programs and policies would you like to implement as county attorney to reduce crime and increase public safety in Itasca County? Number one, I talked about it on the 2018 campaign trail regularly. I, it, my mind that Itasca County was not a part of a drug task force or a violent crime enforcement team. I said in 2018 every one of these uh, sheriff's candidates needs to consider it. I, I kept harping on it even through the pandemic and I got together with one of the Itasca County Sheriff's investigators. We partnered with another investigator in Mille Lacs County and Aiken County, utilized a grant writer applied to the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and now today in Itasca County we have the Aiken Itasca Mille Lacs Violent Crime Enforcement Team. I'm a member of that board. Uh, the bylaws call for one county attorney representative, so it would either be Itasca, Aiken, or Mille Lacs. I sit on that board, I give advisory advice to the group, I review their contracts and their agreements, and I've spoken to each of the sheriff's candidates and said it is critical that Itasca County work with neighboring jurisdictions. We just think about the layout here. We've got Highway 169 and Highway 2, major intersection of two highways in Minnesota. And none of these counties had a, a law enforcement effort where they work together across borders to share information and seek out the crimes and, and bring charges. And now we do, right along that 169 corridor. I'm so proud of that work. I plan on continuing with the board there. Um, I've encouraged the sheriff current sheriff to dedicate a full-time staff member is a great young deputy who's eager to learn. Uh, he's constantly talking with our office. He's doing training. He's doing all kinds of things. So continuing to promote the dedicated effort of this organization, not just with the sheriff's office staffing and participation, but Grand Rapids Police Department, which has an officer, and then encouraging our smaller police departments to continue sharing information because we're getting those cases to review and prosecute. Uh, we're happy to do that here in Itasca County, and I know my counterparts in Aiken and Mille Lacs feel the same way. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, same question. What programs and policies would you implement as county attorney to reduce crime and increase public safety in Itasca County? <clears throat> I think the, I'm going to piggyback and say drop in the program that they have there is a new one. I have advocated as far back as 2018, why do we not also reach out to the Lake Superior Task Force? Because I know in Nashville and Kewanton, we use them. They're a valuable part of the prosecution on the Eastern Range. You gotta remember, there's a port where those drugs can go through and, and follow. I also don't understand why we've never uh, reached out to the West, to the Beltrami and to the native areas west of us to also have that task force, because there's been one there for a long time. We really want to stop drug crime and drug trafficking. There are two others that we simply ignore. I hope that the new sheriff will agree that we need to reach out to all of them. One of the things I just want to mention, I'm disappointed because I thought four years ago we'd get a veterans court. We didn't get a veterans court. Lewis County has an active veterans court we need to have one because veterans need to have a way to address not just the fact that they committed a crime, but why, what else is going on in their life. Let's get to all the things that happen in service-related times and, the, and whether it's uh, an illness, whether it's you know, melanose peat uh, or any other. Is it chemical use? Is it isolation, you know, depression? What is going on? 
And I think the Veterans Court would be a way of saying, let's just stop putting them in the criminal justice system first. Let's get them over to a court, get them the things they need. If it doesn't work, well then we still have the consequence that was there. But let's try something. And that would, I believe, also be used in this county. Just a quick response. Sure. Sure, so um, just a piece of education for the audience. A county can participate in one drug task force or violent crime task force. We do that with the task force that was created just this year. We would not also be a member of the adjoining task forces. That's not how the organization structure and the funding from the state is set up. However, that task force can participate and communicate with those other BCA funded task forces that Mr. Dimmich mentioned, both on the east and west of Itasca County. Um, the AIM VSET is aware of that and that's work that they currently do. With respect to a veterans court, I did also talk about a veterans court. I would love to have a veterans court here. The pandemic put a halt on gathering information because it doesn't make sense to me to utilize taxpayer dollars and resources to fund a court that we don't know that we even have the capacity to sustain. So I have instead partnered with the heads of probation to verify that they are supportive and on board. I've worked with our other problem solving court here in Itasca County that I am a team member of, the Itasca County <coughs> Weapons Court, and have the support of the team to explore if an add-on calendar that could have anywhere from one to, I don't know if we'd ever even get to five offenders for Veterans Court could participate. So it's still in exploratory stages. And my office also complies with the new Minnesota statute that has um, requirements for sentencing, uh, Minnesota Sentencing, Veterans Sentencing Act, where we would defer certain crimes for eligible veterans. Okay, thank you. Um, we have, I think, 18 questions here. Uh, we will not get through all the questions by the end of the time. So <coughs> everyone knows, so I'm just gonna start at the top of the stack and I'm gonna work through. Um, Again, yeah, first one, John, can you respond to this one? Uh, can you tell the audience the appropriate dollar total of fines collected the past two years by people charged with criminal activities to the, par to the private property of Enbridge Energy? Uh, I cannot uh, tell you. We had a <clears throat> county attorney dealt with one case that I was not involved with, which was in Blackberry. I had protesters that dealt with in McCrary. Uh, some of which uh, ultimately were tribe members and the tribe took over prosecutions. Um, but the number that we had um, was not great uh, because, they had, again, they're all misdemeanor level offenses. So you're looking at $125 or maybe $285 on the high end. Um, well, Perry had to bear that cost because unfortunately nobody else stepped up. Enbridge didn't come and say, well, we'll help fund you. Um, so the city of LaPrairie, just because of the fact that they're there, had to bear the burden. So I tried to, to get them resolved. I tried to keep LaPrairie's costs to the lowest because that city can't afford to be in this legal details. Thank you. Abby, same question. Can you tell the audience the approximate dollar total of fines collected the past two years by the people charged with criminal activities to the private property of so no, I can't tell you the exact amount of fines, but I can tell you that my office uh, received case referrals for four individuals uh, out in the Blackberry area for interfering with pipeline property out there. Those are the four cases that the county attorney's office received referrals on and prosecuted. We went to jury trial on each of those four cases, received guilty verdicts, but maybe it wasn't a jury trial. A defendant has a right to a jury trial or a court trial by a judge. And I didn't personally prosecute this case, and so I'm not gonna commit that it was a jury trial. It may have been a court trial, but in any event, they did go to a trial to a fact finder. Um, again, if anyone, if this is your question, feel free to call me in my office tomorrow and I'll give you the right <coughs> answer on jury trial or court trial. But guilty verdicts were returned. Uh, those people were convicted of those misdemeanor offenses. The prosecutor in the case argued that these people should be held accountable. It's a significant public safety offense. Uh, it interferes with our natural resources and the operations of this major corporation. And we asked for those offenders to be remanded to jail and serve jail time um, and asked for the amount of fines that were allowed under the law. And the district court judge heard those arguments and nevertheless sentenced these people basically to credit for time served that they had been arrested. 
Um, so we, we saw that case through, we presented the case, we presented to evidence, we handled many contested hearings prior to going to trial and still saw the case all the way through only to receive those convictions and have the court issue a very low level <coughs> fine and not the jail time that we were asking for. That's what we thought was appropriate. We weren't sure that the judge would give it to us, but that's our job is to make the argument and request what we believe is appropriate in each and every case even if we don't know that we're going to be successful in that. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And this one, you'll answer first. Okay. Um, are either of our candidates members of the bar? Uh, well, I guess I won't answer for Mr. Tippett, but um, I know that uh, I'm a member of the bar, and I believe that when anyone files to be an elected county attorney, you must present your bar license. So I, I suspect his answer will be the same, that we both had to make that presentation. Actually, it is correct that you must show an attorney's license, that you're licensed by the state of Minnesota. Are we members of the Bar Association? I have been. I currently am the vice president of the, uh, what we call the 15th District Bar Association, which will meet next year in Walker. Again, because of COVID, we've had to meet remotely. So I've been active in that organization because I think it's important to have other lawyers. John, before you have to sit down, there's, there's a couple of parts to this one, so okay. I'm, I'm thinking you can do this one, too. Uh, can you define what, what the acronym BAR means, or stands for? It's an association of attorneys that um, choose to belong um, to, in this case, the Minnesota State Bar Association. It is an organization which does provide information to us through a, through a monthly newsletter. It also provides a wonderful source for you when you have questions about legal issues that are going on that you don't have enough background on, or at least would like another eye looking at it. So it's a combination group of member attorneys. Unfortunately, the number of people who belong to the bar actually over time is decreasing because like much many other organizations, we don't get some of the younger lawyers who want to be members of <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that covers this. Um, you have anything to add, Patty, to that? No. Okay. And John, this one's yours first. Um, do you believe that a person who makes a false allegation should be prosecuted? And if no, have you or have you ever prosecuted anyone during your tenure for that? I have prosecuted a person who falsely reports a crime. It's important that you look at that because when you make the referral to law enforcement, what do you do? You make law enforcement do a number of things to be doing an investigation. They need to take statements, they need to uh, gather the evidence, all of this, and if it's based on something that really didn't happen and really wasn't a crime, yes, that person should have the responsibility of then being charged with what is then called also reporting a crime. There was no crime, and you should have not reported it and started uh, all this extra state effort in that area. Okay, Maddie, same question. Do you believe that a person who makes a false allegation should be prosecuted? And if no, have you or did you ever prosecute anyone during your tenure? For this? I can think of a couple cases where my office has filed uh, falsely reporting a crime charges. I think just like any other case, you have to look at the specific facts that are presented and the applicable law. And um, if there's something underlying going on, like the person is mentally ill, um, we would take the information from law enforcement and discuss with the officer if bringing criminal charges was really in the best interest of, of that person and maybe make a referral to the vulnerable adult section and health and human services or commitment or something like that. So I can see a case there where maybe we wouldn't charge it. I can think of another example where we have charged it, and this was an individual who's now charged with uh, DWI, fleeing in a motor vehicle. This is a recent event that happened in Grand Rapids. Uh, the, the police were looking for this individual based upon a suspicious vehicle report. Um, the, the person driving the vehicle knew that law enforcement was looking at them, that person actually called in a crime 
in the different part of Grand Rapids, the 911 center, to distract law enforcement, have them go to a different part of town and use that opportunity to flee. So that was a case where we definitely added that charge on. Um, of course, the person is charged with felonies as well. And so will they ultimately be convicted of a lower level offense or will we pursue those felonies aggressively? That's probably what will happen there. But I can think of a handful of other cases where we have considered and filed that charge as well. So it's always on the table. Oh, yeah. Yeah, That's fine. Uh, how long can a county court judge hold a citizen, person, or resident in jail for contempt charges? Oh, for contempt charges, it's it's hard to know exactly what the question asker is asking here. Would you like to see see clarification from the asker? Uh, we have contempt in a couple areas, so that might be helpful. Well, let's say, for example, if uh, I was to walk into a court and say, Your Honor, I'm here by divine presence to ask this court for a summary judgment on the case that my documents have been sent in, certified, published, and recorded on this subject matter. Would that judge hold me in contempt of court? Okay. I can't say what, it, thank you. Uh, I can't say what the judge would do. That would be a civil contempt order. That would not be a criminal contempt charge. Occasionally we'll see a law enforcement officer write a ticket for a criminal contempt when actually what's going on is the person has violated their conditions of release, uh, which is not a contempt of court, or committed a probation violation which we handle as a probation violation. But in a civil contempt case, or the other instance that I was thinking about, sir, is in child support cases. Uh, the child support division will sometimes bring contempt actions where a person has failed to pay their child support. This goes on for a long period of time. They continue to defy the court orders. We bring the matter in front of the judge, and the judge says, here's your last opportunity to comply with my order of the court. Your example would be an order of the court. If you fail to do so, I, the judge, not me, but I'm giving the example here, will hold you in contempt. When a judge does that, that's a civil contempt case, and the person has to be given a remedy. Um, in a child support case, it's pay this amount of money or give your child support worker and the court a list of three places that you've recently applied for a job or write out a plan to go in and apply for jobs. So there's some kind of condition, essentially the keys to court, and so your example, sir, would have the same kind of thing. It would be crafted by a judge. Okay. Okay, just for clarification for the audience, the only time that we'll ask the audience for additional information is if one of the candidate forums asks for it. Um, John, same question. How long can a county court judge hold a citizen, person, or resident in jail for contempt of charges? Again, I think it depends on, in the example that that individual used, um, uh, George makes an order, finds them in contempt, but they can't put them in there without giving them a remedy as to how they can cure the, con the contempt, and they need to get them back to court as soon as possible to readdress that. There's no, I don't think it's one of those things like in criminal law where you have 36 hours to hold somebody. I mean, this is a, an action, it's just like in, she was mentioning county attorney in, in child support enforcement, Yes, they may be in contempt, but they still have to have some ability to, to do whatever it is. Get the child support order current, give them information to maybe justify why that current child support order isn't appropriate anymore, they're not working, they're, or their hours have been reduced, but they need to have an ability to go back to that judge as soon as possible and uh, address that, because nobody, it's not a, we don't believe in people being in, in prisons or in jail. That's not the, the remedy. We don't have what we call debtor prisons. And so a person, even if in contempt, has a right to be back in front of that judge uh, as soon as they possibly can be. Okay, thank you. <coughs> you get this one. Okay, I know it. <laughs> uh, currently there are dozens of state 13, or I'm sorry, dozens of statute 13 data laws being violated in the county. Will the candidates pledge to end the two-tier justice system in the county attorney's office and 
prosecute elected officials and bureaucrats? Short answer is yes. If you violate the Data Practices Act, somebody mentioned it, it's a misdemeanor. It doesn't just define it as, well, oh, it's a misdemeanor only if you're somebody, okay, or you're not somebody. If you commit a crime, you commit a crime. The job of the county attorney is to review it, prosecute it, and hold that person accountable. Because what's the purpose of a law if you don't have enforcement? So my quick answer is, you'll get enforcement if I'm elected. Patty, same question. Currently, there are dozens of Statute 13 data laws being violated. Will the candidates pledge to end the two-tier justice, justice system in the county attorney's office and prosecute elected officials and bureaucrats? So first, there's not a two-tier justice system in Itasca County Attorney's Office or in the district courts in Itasca County. Every single case that's presented after a full and thorough investigation is reviewed based upon those facts and the applicable law. I've heard um, repeatedly from some members of the community, or one member of the community, that there are dozens of Chapter 13 violations. I've asked for specific examples. Give me the nature of the request, the date of the request, who it was made to, where you assert there to be a violation, that information hasn't been provided. It really should go to law enforcement to be investigated, but if I did receive that information, I would make a referral to the appropriate law enforcement agency to have that looked at. Uh, it's not the role of a county attorney or any prosecutor to bring charges based on assertions. That's not, that's not what the job is. We have to make decisions based off of facts, what is admissible evidence, what we believe that we can prove, not a person's claim without support for the, that claim. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So oh, yes. This, one first. <laughs> uh, this is under, listed as Castle Law. Can each candidate explain your understanding of the law? Sure, so I think this is um, the self-defense of home or stand your ground law. Um, Minnesota law does impose a duty to retreat. Um, that's based upon the objective circumstances of the individual in the home and the level of threat that is presented. So a uh, really boiled down version, and we might see that the violence being raised as a defense if say there were a, an intruder shooting, but we haven't had that case presented yet, but that's what I think this would look like if we were to see it in Itasca County, is to determine um, you know, what, what was that intruder doing and what did the homeowner who pulled the firearm and, and shot the person, what did they reasonably apprehend the fear to be? That they were about to be killed, that their family were to be killed, that there would be great bodily harm. Um, those are the things to look at. But Minnesota does improve, it impose a duty to retreat, um, and then only duty to retreat if it's possible, and then to only use the amount of force that's necessary to, to respond to the force presented. Okay. John, same question, Castle Law. Can each candidate explain your understanding of the law? I think uh, Maddie has done a good job of explaining it, uh, but I think I, you need to know that um, I think it's important that a person has a right to defend their property. And uh, I'm gonna be one of those who looks very hard at why would we prosecute somebody if they're reacting to somebody who co who's coming into their house. They don't have a right to be in that house. They weren't invited in. There's a danger, and uh, I'll, I'll stand behind that person to say, you know, that this is why we need to have the ability to protect our own person, our own property. John, you're up again. Yep. I was going to say that. I will catch you. Um, would you be willing to accept a blind review on one of your cold cases by an outside agency? That specializes in prosecutions of sexual assault free of charge, and if not, why? Um, I have been very familiar with a case where somebody got the assistance of the Attorney General's office to do such a blind review with another county attorney's office in the cities. Uh, that didn't happen because the county attorney declined to let it go there. All I can tell you is if that same situation happens today, I will reach out, I will say, willingly, review it by some other county. Maybe you see things I don't see, maybe you have a different take on the statute or on the facts, and I need, I'll listen to that opinion and uh, react, and if 
it's appropriate to charge after the review, uh, then that's what will happen. Okay, thank you. Patty, would you be willing to accept a blind review on one of your cold cases by an outside agency that specializes in prosecutions of sexual assault free of charge, and if not, why? I think it, it depends on what the circumstances are, and what's important for everyone to keep in mind is we are a government law office. We operate, we do our work, so do these other government law offices with taxpayer dollars. And so it's really important to consider how we're utilizing our resources. And sometimes at a certain point, a, a decision has to be final. And the case that I believe that this is about is a case that originated prior to my even coming to Itasca County to work as an attorney. Um, and to my knowledge, this case has been reviewed by two current or former elected county attorneys and a current judge. Both, all three of these people have decades of experience as criminal prosecutors and independently on their own arrived at the same conclusions. And so at a certain point, you have to trust that seasoned professionals um, make those judgments. And in some cases, absolutely, we might review. However, if I received a request from an outside agency to conduct a blind review and that request came outside of, um, excuse me, there's a fly bug in here, outside of the normal channels of county attorney, how county attorney offices operate, we might not do that. There is a, a proper process to follow. Um, in this instance, it, it was asserted that the Hennepin County Attorney's Office was going to review a case. I did not receive an inquiry or request from the County Attorney's Office. Uh, numerous communications came out of my office requesting follow-up and information. Those things didn't happen. I relied upon the judgment and input of those three professionals that separately reviewed and declined charges in that case. And we continued to move forward and review cases that came in from that time and now continue to come in every single day from law enforcement, utilize our resources there in processing cases. Thank you. Um, you get to the next question? Yes. <laughs> it's a little distracting. <laughs> That's okay. The, um, I'm, this is uh, asked from a member of the, uh, the audience. I'm going to paraphrase this a bit just so that it's, it's uh, there's specific items in here which I have no ability to know if they're true or not, so I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit over it. County Attorney's Office currently turns conflict cases over to local counties, Cass, St. Louis, Coloring, Growing, Beltran, etc. Because of proximity, uh, these may not be completely unbiased jurisdictions. Um, the current elected individual has been investigated multiple times. Uh, and they, all of these have been sent to the above counties. Will the candidates pledge to end this practice and send these cases out to unbiased counties further away from Itasca County? So one, the current practice works. I don't believe that neighboring counties are biased. As I said, that this is how the conflict referral process happens across the state of Minnesota. Um, all, all county attorney's offices are very, very busy. It, is, it can be a big ask to ask another county to take on a conflict case, so you do it based upon um, availability. If someone just had a homicide in their jurisdiction, they're probably not going to be available to do a conflict review for your office. And so we kind of rotate cases generally within our geographic area, and every one of my brother and sister elected county attorneys extends the favor just as we do in return. I've prosecuted a police officer from the International Falls Police Department, prosecuted that case myself to conviction. I never felt conflicted. I never felt any allegiance to the Kuchiching County Attorney. I'm prosecuting that now former police officer for a different offense because it was a conflict once. It would be a conflict for Kuchiching County Attorney's Office to handle it now. Um, Carleton County has a number of cases from Itasca County that they are reviewing. Uh, Lori Ketala over there it is an excellent prosecutor. She runs a great office. I trust that she's doing her job when I refer a case over there. Same with Cass County, Beltrami County, Lake County, St. Louis County. It is not my job to interfere with a conflict case. Once I make a determination that there's a conflict, I check on availability and then we make the referral and we trust that all other prosecutors in the state of Minnesota are treating that case exactly the same. And I know that before another county attorney would accept a case, if they looked at the case and determined that they also had a conflict or even the appearance of impropriety in a case based upon the involved individuals or officers, they would decline to accept that case and we would continue the hunt for a different conflict attorney. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. John, same question. County Attorney's Office currently turns over conflict cases to local counties such as Cass, St. Louis, Crowley, Beltrami, etc. Because of location and proximity, uh, these may, be, may not be completely unbiased. Uh, current elected official has been investigated multiple times, and those conflict cases have been referred to the above listed counties. Will the candidates pledge to end this practice and send these cases out to unbiased counties further away from Itasca County? <clears throat> that's, an, that's one you don't have to worry about. I will pledge today that we will reach out to other counties farther distance away and we will send those referrals. Because frankly, <clears throat> I appreciate that the county attorneys around us, not saying they're not attorneys, but I have concerns and I think the public has concerns as to how are we getting a true unbiased report if we're always intermingling, sending things from a short distance. Don't, I don't believe it's going to be a fair one if an elected official is being invested in by somebody in Cass County or Carleton County. No, we need to get that off to the cities. We've got how many county attorneys down there in the, the metro area or in St. Cloud or Rochester? They'd be willing, I know they would be willing to do it because we'll build it and I will build that relationship so they know that I'll make that referral and then I, I know or have a better confidence to know that the decision they make will be based on the law, on the facts, and no other considerations other than it should be charged and why it should be charged and then get and do the charging. And if it's not, they'll, they'll, I am also confident that they'll say the same thing. Uh, in terms of sending cases down to the metro area, Ramsey County is not prosecuting cases that arise or originate out of traffic stops. I don't think that's what the people of Itasca County want. I don't, that's not what I want as a criminal prosecutor. If an officer makes a stop and there is contraband, large amount of drugs found in the vehicle, that case should be prosecuted. Hennepin County, we make referrals down there for theft of motor vehicle cases that occur in Hennepin County, and those cases are not even reviewed for charging. That is not where we want the cases of Itasca County to go. Instead, it's best to utilize our neighboring people who follow the law, review the facts, and have relationships, know what their obligations are. I don't think that the people of Itasca County want the metro area making decisions for them on matters of prosecution. I asked that question and specifically asked about elected officials in the bureaucracy, not car theft or anything like that. And we had a cop on cop crime in Grand Rapids. It was sent to Cass County. If any one of us would have slapped a cop and brandished a loaded weapon, Second we either would be lying in a pool of our own blood or we would be in jail right now. And it did not happen. And that case should be re referred to another county. But she refuses to do it. Again, this is not a debate with the members of the audience. This is for the candidates to answer questions from the public as well as they can. Um, next question, John, it's for you. What is your practice to ensure information is not being released to the public that is not public data yet? <coughs> I am aware of that if there is criminal and it's still under investigation, we can't release it. But at least I would tell you that that's why I'm not releasing it and give you an estimate as to when we'll make a decision as to charging or not charging it. And once it's charged, it's a lot of that becomes public. If it's not charged, it becomes public. Again, there are certain kinds of evidence that you can't or get because it might be in uh, litigation or it might be something dealing with labor. But we need to tell people why and give them a, an estimate of where it's going, how long it might take before they can get their answer. Because there is a point where I think that information should be released to the public. Matt, same question. What is your practice to ensure information is not being released to the public that is not public data yet? It's covered by the statutes in the state of Minnesota, Chapter 13. Again, government data is presumed public, um, but there are exceptions. And active criminal justice investigative data is one of those items that is protected. And so we have uh, Itasca County data policy on it. We have annual training that occurs. And then we have our case management software that controls a lot of it. 
again, if we were to receive a data request, we would respond with the data um, that was appropriate to that request at the time that it was made. Thank you. We are within 10 minutes of 8 o'clock when this will conclude. Um, each candidate has five minutes to do a summary. Uh, sir, I had to ask before that you never told me it has to be in writing, and I've got these papers I'd like to give to each one of them. If you have something that you're just delivering to them, that's fine. I'd like after, 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 after. Yeah, if, let's, let's let them finish their remarks and then we can give them to them. Okay? Yeah. So five minutes each, if you want to take a drink of water, if you want to stand up, sit down, it's up to you. Five minutes each for closing statements. And then we'll have party gifts. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So first and foremost, thank you to the group for organizing. Very much appreciated to have the opportunity to speak to voters. I've been doing it for months um, on the campaign trail, and I've been speaking to constituents since day one of taking the office. I regularly have people come to the office, place phone calls, send emails or letters, and I do my very best to respond to each and every one of those in a timely manner. I've made my personal cell phone number available out there in the community. I encourage people um, to reach out to me with the questions or concerns that they have. So I'm asking for your vote to re-elect me as Itasca County Attorney. I showed up on day one understanding the job, and that's because I work there now. I worked there in 2018 and the years leading up to that, doing everything from child protection, child support, contract review, tax appeals, developing policies with road and bridge, working with law enforcement, providing law enforcement training, reviewing, charging, prosecuting cases, bringing convictions, after delivery, after presenting cases to juries. I've argued at the Minnesota Supreme Court, some lawyers in Minnesota, a good number of lawyers in Minnesota, never do it. It's our highest court, I've been there, I've received a favorable opinion that positively impacted the state of the law in the state of Minnesota. I'm here and I want to be here representative because I want our community to be safe. If there is conduct in the community that is wrongful, that is illegal, that presents a public safety risk, and we have the evidence to prosecute those crimes, we are getting convictions. That's what we are about at the county attorney's office. Disposition is different. We can impose lesser sentencing, um, lesser sentence recommendations with treatment and programming for those people that don't present a public safety risk, that may struggle with mental illness, transportation barriers, chemical dependency, and that's appropriate and that's just, and our courts issue it when they hear from us and agree that it's correct. On the other end of the spectrum, you are hurting people, you are bringing drugs in our community, those people are going to prison. That is why we have the sentencing guidelines that say that those are the appropriate, those are the appropriate sentences. I'm doing that right now. I do it in felony cases. I pick the cases that are tough, that I get to work with victims. I have victim families that I have close relationships for. Nothing gets me going more than representing a family who's had a two-year-old killed by a repeat DWI offender, those people should be prosecuted aggressively, and that's what we do at the county attorney's office. I've jotted down a list here of just a few cases that I've personally handled. Um, criminal sexual conduct offender in prison for 234 months, prosecuted by me. Uh, individual who kidnapped and sexually assaulted a young woman in our community. This was just this year, 95 months in prison. First degree assault on a police officer, shooting at multiple officers in our community. That could have been an officer involved shooting case. It was an officer involved shooting case. We were able to review it, handle it on our own, not send it to the attorney general's office, and instead we charged that offender. He's in prison for 189 months. Three officer wives I dealt with on that case, that their husbands had to come home, thankfully came home at the end of their shift, after being shot at by this offender. 105 months for that criminal vehicular homicide. 48 months in prison for another criminal vehicular homicide DWI offender. Uh, criminal sexual conduct, 51 months in prison after going to jury trial with a young woman who was assaulted by her stepfather uh, more than one time. First degree drug offenses. I have four stacked up right now waiting for jury trials, we can 
can get to a jury trial. I have one individual, I'm sorry to tell you, pled guilty. He's now out in the community. He's a drug seller. He has guns that he's not permitted to have. I negotiated guilty pleas, and he will be going to prison. Other drug offenders, 64 months in prison, 94 months, 95 months in prison. This is what I do. I answer the phone at night. My family can tell you that. I answered the phone this weekend while I was out in the middle of the woods trying to enjoy a beautiful Saturday. I show up at court each and every day. City prosecution, not always at court. Several hearing dates this summer where there's no prosecutor. County attorney's office, we are there every day. I am there at night if the phone rings. I am out at a crime scene if I need to be. That's the kind of office I run. I want to say the family safe and do this in an efficient and professional manner. Thank you. Thank you. I'm running for county attorney because, first of all, I believe that we have to reduce the cost of government. And one of the ways we're going to do it is reduce the number of people in offices. You know, just in April of last, before the election started, they were, they were down to seven attorneys. Could they have waited and not filled them? No, they couldn't have. They had to fill them immediately with two more staff people. I've shown through court documents that they had 2,088 cases in 1993, and we could do that with four attorneys. Now, 42 cases less, they do it with nine. There's something wrong with that. We have five attorneys in the criminal justice system assigned to the civil, and then juvenile and the other child support doesn't get much. But why does, does child support go from 220 cases in 1990 Three to 90, why is it dropping? Cases are dropping, but staff is not dropping. And in the same time that we're doing this, $53,000 in overtime was authorized last year. For almost $12,000 of which is for one attorney who primarily was working at home. This is the kind of thing we have to work for. Now we're going back to court. Two times in the last month, I've gone to court when there's nine attorneys, nine defendants, and 11 defendants. A couple of them, I had cases with them. We have three attorneys in that courtroom from the county attorneys, and three assistants. We couldn't send one with a direction. They know what the, the proposed agreements are. They're in writing, they're on their computer. It's the kind of what I call lack of leadership. But it's the lack of leadership that permeates the whole county. That's why we don't have a good, solid um, transparency and why data practices gets so little attention. It's why at county board meetings, the county attorney is sitting there not participating and letting the court county administrator, who's not a lawyer, run that board meeting. There are legal decisions being made and only the county attorney. Remember, you're hiring somebody, you are the only people in Itasca County who get to choose the sheriff, the county attorney, and the auditor treasurer because you want somebody who is independent. And the only way you're going to get that is somebody who is willing to stand up. I say change needs to happen. Change needs to, in our, we're going to have three commissioners. It's a time for government to look towards living within a budget. And it has to start somewhere, and I think one place it needs to start is the county attorney. So I thank you all for listening to me tonight, and I ask you all to, to consider me on November 8th as your candidate for Itasca County Attorney. In Itasca County, we get taxed $1,705,000. $687 for unorganized township roads. There are none. I am giving you these papers. Now you knowingly know how do we get to resolve this. Thank you. In my unorganized township, we have not even a half mile of roads. We get taxed for unorganized townships. We get taxed for county roads. There aren't there. I want to thank everybody for off. coming. Having high qualified candidates like this is really something.
That's great, fantastic coming. So thank you both for coming. Actually, for all of you for coming tonight, for spending the time, for educating yourself, for seeing the differences. It's your choice. Thank you very much for coming. You got it. You got it.